We entitled it the Epistle of Jesus because I wanted to emphasize the fact that um, this is the Lord's letter to us as his churches and to all of God's people. That he has not forgotten us, that no matter how dark it may seem in this world, um, he is aware of what's happening and he has a plan. And we're especially going to look at that plan this morning, what we might call God's program for the ages, as it plays out not just in the book of Revelation, but uh, all the way back to the book of Daniel and also in the book of Matthew chapter 24. You can't understand and properly, properly get what you need from Revelation if you don't know what happened in Daniel chapter 9. I'm hesitant. It's too late now, but I'm still hesitant. <laughs> Because we, I'm, I'm biting off a lot here, and I want to get done in a decent amount of time. Um, Charles, not Charles Wesley, but uh, John Calvin once said that the study of prophecy either finds a man mad or it leaves him that way. Well, I don't want you mad because I preached an hour and a half on the message. He was talking about a different kind of mad, but uh, I think you understand the other kind a little bit better. So, God's people have always been a people of persecution and tribulation. This has always been true. From the time that uh, Abel was slain by Cain, to Pharaoh's killing of the firstborn, to the tribulation itself, the people of the book have always been under attack. If anything, we in the United States have lived in a, a, a parentheses of, of a kind of a paradise and peace. And that goes back to the fact the way our country was founded and the laws upon which it was founded. And so we are, if anything, we are outliers. We are an exception to the rule. The rest of the world is very much still under that same persecution and tribulation. And so it should come no, as no surprise to us when we come to the book of Revelation that we see this intensifying. For once the church is removed, then the, the uh, power that rules this world, Satan, will have full sway, full influence, and will be able to turn his full wrath upon all the things of God and especially the people of God. Satan hates all things of God, but especially his people in the nation of Israel and in his institution, the church. These he actively and constantly seeks to erase from his sphere of power. He has not and never will succeed, but it is only for a moment that he wins here, as it seems in the book of Revelation. Such a time that we see as in the apocalypse, the unveiling of the true coming king is in chapter 6, when we look at the seven sealed scroll as it's opened and the last tribulation of God's people begins and then in seven terrible horrifying years ends with all the persecution of God finally brought to a close by the power of God. So before we can come to that this last persecution we must go back to an earlier time of trouble for God's people and that is uh, this time for the nation of Israel as much as Christians are the most persecuted group in the world today. The one who's been more historically persecuted has always been the nation of Israel. It has always been God's original people. Uh, that has been almost ceaseless for them throughout the world. So, in this passage, if you would go with me to Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. And I don't often use more than one passage of scripture for a text, but we're going to do that this morning. As we look in this passage of scripture, we see that God's people have been scattered. Uh, the main group of them have been taken into captivity in the city of Babylon or in the nation of Babylon. And uh, they've been taken from their homeland, but they have not been taken from God. And they have not been taken from God's plan for his people. In this time of captivity, Daniel, uh, the man who the Bible said was much loved of God, prays and God reveals to him his plan for God's people who are at this very dark time of, of persecution. Seemingly, they're on the verge of being erased as a people. They've been absorbed into another nation. And so Daniel begins to pray. And the prophecy that he receives, the message from God that he receives, is the keystone, the foundation to all the end time prophecies of God. We must be aware of it. We must understand it. Or else we cannot rightly understand the book of Revelation. And I have to say this, I have sat through many Bible studies and I've sat through many sermons on which Revelation is taught without ever considering the Old Testament ramifications and especially Daniel chapter 9. 
And it's almost always, in some major or minor point, wrong. You can't understand Revelation without understanding Daniel 9. That's why we're going there. So look at this foundational scripture. Daniel 9th chapter, 24th verse. I'm going to do my best to just pick out the succinct verses, the ones that are essential, and then go from there. So, 70 weeks, verse 27, 70 weeks are determined on thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem in, unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with a flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he talking about the prince that is to come, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, that's all in Hebrew poetry, and so if it sounds even a little more difficult to grasp, that's one of the reasons why. So let me give you a little bit of background to Daniel's vision and this brings us to Daniel's doubts. Daniel was having difficulty understanding what God was doing uh, as he was there in captivity in Babylon. So Daniel began praying because he had read the writings of Jeremiah that God had given 70 years for the people of Israel to be in captivity. And then he was going to bring them back. Uh, he read, read this in Jeremiah 25, verse 11, also verse 12. It says, when 70 years are accomplished, I will punish the king of Babylon. And then in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, verse 20, it says, And them that escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. So without going into a lot of what's being said here, basically we need to understand that Jeremiah and the book of Second Chronicles said there were 70 years that they were going to be in captivity. So Daniel reads this. He understands what it's saying. Now it's been 50 years. The Babylonian king, uh, the story of the writing on the wall has already taken place, and the Babylon, Babylonian empire has fallen. And so Daniel knows it's getting close. That king has been uh, destroyed. He's gone. And as he thinks about these things, he looks around at the people of Israel, uh, his brethren, his uh, brothers and sisters in the nation of Israel, and he sees people who have not repented. He sees people who have not turned back to God. He sees people that are caught up in idolatry. For every one of a Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, there are hundreds that have given themselves fully and completely to the gods of uh, Nebuchadnezzar and the gods of the Persians. And so he doesn't understand. He has his doubts. How has this worked? Why would God let us go back to our homeland when we are still such a sinful, adulterous people? He begins to pray. He begins to fast. He confesses his sins and the sins of the people. The whole uh, first part of chapter 9 is his prayer. And then as he's praying, God sends his angel, this time a named angel, Gabriel, and he gives the answer to Daniel of God's perspective. His plan for the ages. This foundational scripture. Not just Jeremiah's 70 years, but of God's thousands of years and even into eternity. It is here in verses 24 and 27 through 27. And it's called the 70 weeks prophecy. Daniel is told in chapter 9 verse 24, 70 weeks are determined on thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So, up here on the screen are the six purposes of God's plan, which will occur during that 70-week time period. To finish the transgression, this means to complete it. The transgressions that Daniel was still seeing with his people, God, through Gabriel, says, this 70-week prophecy is what's going to be needed. That time period is going to bring an end to that. 
It says to make an end of sins. Literally, this means to seal up. And it means uh, that we be brought under full constraint. To make reconciliation for iniquity. This was looking forward to the Savior, the Messiah, dying upon the cross and paying the price, bringing reconciliation. The first three of these are very negative. The last ones are very positive. Uh, number four is to bring in everlasting righteousness, affected by that inward moral transformation, that new covenant, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Number five is to seal up the vision and the prophecies. This will be the end. At the end of that 70 weeks time period, there's no more prophecy. And then number six, to anoint the most holy. This is probably talking about the temple, not the most holy in the sense of the Messiah. He's already been mentioned earlier in these six. This is the temple that would be rebuilt during that time. So what kind of time period is the word week describing? Because certainly it didn't just take 70 weeks as we think of weeks for this to take place. The Hebrew word here is the word Shabuah. I'm sure you're all going to write that down and make it as part of your vocabulary your Hebrew and Greek work. You know, I looked it up, so you're going to get it too. It means seven, a period of seven. It can be days, it can be years. And in this case, because of what Daniel's asking about, the context can only be years because it did not take 70 weeks. It took 70, uh, 490 years, 70 weeks, 70 times seven. So this plan for the ages has a starting point. It's there in verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So when the Persian king granted Nehemiah the right to rebuild the walls around Jerusalem, God's program to reclaim his people, the nation of Israel, stopped, started. So it's as if God had a, a stopwatch. And when that edict was given and the king told Nehemiah, go and rebuild that wall, God clicked it and it started ticking. It started ticking. Uh, up here on the screen, I give you, I've given you a uh, timeline. It's probably not that easy to read from where you're at. But the beginning of that is that restore, restoration of Israel. That took place in about 530 and lasted until 424 BC when the wall was completed. That's the first seven weeks to rebuild the wall. That comes down to the next part is that 62 weeks and it says unto Messiah the Prince. And so at 69 weeks, Messiah is revealed. That probably took place when he entered into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. Uh, behold, your uh, Messiah riding on a, a donkey. And the people knew this, and that was, if you took the time, you're probably going to be glad I'm not going to do this. We could actually go back and find the timing of the uh, edict given by the king and trace it all the way down to the time in which the Lord rode in Jerusalem. And you know what? It works out exactly yeah. within a month. Because that's as close as we can make it to that time. That's how accurate and how much God uh, is working this to that finite detail. That stopwatch is ticking and it comes all the way down to that 69th week when Messiah is uh, revealed. Then it simply says that the Messiah would be cut off after the 69th week. We're not told anything more specific than that. All we're told is he's cut off. Now we know that it was right at that. Within a week of the triumphal entry, Christ is crucified and he is cut off. And Daniel makes sure that, uh, that Gabriel makes sure Daniel understood, but not for himself, but for us. That was the redemption that's going to come. And so he is cut off in verse 26. And then we are told that the prince of the people, that the people of the prince that shall come will destroy the city. The sanctuary would be destroyed. And this is a prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem. That took place in 70 A.D., by the Roman Empire that had taken over and subjugated the Jews during that time. This reference to the prince who is to come is the he in verse 27. And it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. So one seven year time period. The last week of Daniel's 70 year prophecy. This last week we'll see uh, fully revealed in Revelation. This prince who is to come is the Antichrist. He comes from the same people or same kingdom who destroyed the temple in A.D. 70, and he signs a covenant with Israel. That covenant and nothing else begins the final week of Daniel's prophecy. It cannot be a Muslim ruler, because that is not of that empire. It cannot be <laughs> President Obama or President Trump or President Carter or President... It cannot be 
Not unless he's part of the, a new Roman Empire that we don't know about. It cannot be. It has to be that old empire that controlled all of the world back during that time. That's going to be who comes and offers peace to Israel. So this one final piece of the prophecy, that simply says that in the midst of the week, that last seven year time period, that he, that uh, Antichrist, this prince that is to come, will cause the sacrifice and the oblations to cease. Here the Antichrist, the beast of the book of Revelation, will cause a sacrifice and offering in the temple to cease. This will occur three and a half years after the covenant is signed, right in the middle of the tribulation. Now it's interesting that after this prophecy is given, Gabriel tells Daniel, seal it up. It's not for right now. That's not told to John in the book of Revelation. But this prophecy was to be revealed and really understood in our time, in the time perhaps of John. But it begins here, it's foundational. Daniel's time was a time of oppression for God's captive people. Daniel prayed and God gave a prophecy of hope. And that's what almost all prophecy is about to the people of God. It means it doesn't matter how dark it gets. It doesn't matter how it seems hopeless to us. God has a plan. Now, it may involve us personally, but even if it doesn't, he has a plan for his people. He has a plan for his nation. He has a plan for his church. He has a plan for the people of God. And the people of God are under his care, his protection, his seal, as we're going to see later on in the book of Revelation. And therefore, it doesn't, whatever is happening around us on a personal level or on a national level or on a global level, God has a plan. And this passage in Daniel chapter 9 is the foundational part of that plan. Everything from here builds forward. So, take a look now with me from the foundational, let's go to the reinforcement, Matthew chapter 24. And again, we're just going to take scriptures uh, that uh, we can go to quickly. I don't want to leave you mad. Matthew chapter 24, look at verses 1 through 3. Here's the reinforcement, and it's given by Jesus Christ himself. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. So his disciples, we find out from the book of Luke, there's actually just three with him. And they say, look at this magnificent temple. This is the heart of Israel. This is the heart of Jerusalem. This is the glory of our nation. And as they're showing him this, Jesus in verse 2 says, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily, most truly I say unto you, There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. He says, Here's, what, <laughs> here's the truth about your magnificent heart of Israel, your magnificent Jerusalem. It's going to be obliterated. It's going to be completely raised to the, to the core not to be rebuilt again until the book of Revelation. And as he set up on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. So there's no one else around. There's just the disciples, and there's just Jesus. And they're so shocked by what he said that they ask him these questions. Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So the disciples are caught in this dilemma. Jesus will come back, but the temple, the thing that they're so proud of, which really was the heart of Israel at that time, and the thing that uh, showed them as a nation will be completely destroyed. Much like Daniel, that the people of God would go back into dispersion. They'd be removed from their homeland. Go down with me to verse 4, as Jesus, as Jesus begins to answer these questions. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these, in verse 8, are the beginning of sorrows. So he says, this is the beginning. Now skip down with me to verse 15. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation... Spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. That means in the holy place in the temple. Whoso readeth, let him understand. And so he ties what he is saying right back to Daniel chapter 9. He says this is a reinforcement. This is an expansion of what Daniel was telling way back in Daniel chapter 9. Then go to verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened. 
The moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Now, if, if we were doing a Bible study, I would, I would do more with this, but I, I can't, we don't have that kind of time. And I'm trying to just get us to the point where we can get back into the Revelation chapter 6. But what we can see here is that Matthew chapter 24 is tied back to Daniel. Jesus tells us it's the same prophecy. He makes the connection both with the beginning of the time of tribulation and also with the midpoint of the tribulation and the destruction of the temple. All those things tie it directly back to Daniel chapter 9. It's an expansion of the same prophecy. It's part of God's program and plan for the ages for his people. So during this time of their doubts and fears. This dilemma they're caught up on. He says. I'm the answer. When you see the son of man coming in power in heaven. He's the answer to all the questions they might have. So now let's move to Revelation chapter 6. And no that wasn't the introduction. That's points 1 and 2. You're well down the road. Revelation chapter 6, and let's look at the final time of Jacob's trouble, as the Old Testament calls a tribulation. This is the tribulation that will be the last for God's people, Israel. This is the final revelation. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. We have been in the throne room. We have heard the cry for who is worthy to open the book. The lamb steps forward uh, after being uh, identified as the lion of the tribe of Judah. John looks and he sees the lamb that looks, has been slain. He takes the book from the one on the throne. He takes the book from, the, uh, from God the Father. This is the title deed to the universe. This is the plan for the rest of the book of Revelation. And he is the only one worthy to take that book. And so we pick up in chapter 6 verse 1. And I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard as it were the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering, and to conquer. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come, and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come, and see. And I beheld in lo a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and a measure and three measures of barley for a penny. See, thou heard not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw unto the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them. And it was said unto them, that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants and also their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken by a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll that is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth. And the great men and the rich men and the chief captains. And the mighty men and every bondman and every free man. Hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us. Hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne. And from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? That's dramatic. <laughs> You should have uh, James Earl Jones or somebody like that read that for you. <laughs> Bring back Alexander Scorby. Here we find John's despair. He's on the Isle of Patmos. He has been banished, left by the emperor of Rome to die there. And he has no contact back with the churches that he's left behind. 
and this, this dark time of, of his soul, he needs comfort. He needs something to let him know God has not deserted him, nor has God deserted his people. Both the Old Testament, the Old Covenant people, and the New Covenant people, the saved of the church age and the elect of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he needs to know that God has not forgot his people. So once again, as it was with Daniel and with the disciples on the Mount of Olives, it's a dark picture. Even darker and more horrific when all the details are revealed in Revelation. Yet it ends with this glorious picture of Jesus' return, his kingdom, and eternity itself. In the end, it is the most wonderful, the most detailed, and the most beautiful revelation that's ever given. This is the final revelation. Nothing's going to come after this. Made even more wonderful by the contrast of all the horror and the tribulation that has gone before it. So John sees the Lamb open the seven-sealed book, one seal at a time. This scroll is the title deed of heaven and earth, the universe itself. It is also the final revelation of God's plan for the ages. What we first saw in Daniel chapter 9 is now fully revealed in Revelation. This is his final redemption of his people, Israel. What John sees in visions, we read as the book of Revelation. As those seals are opened, he sees it, but we read it. And all of it is found in a scroll held in the hand of the Lamb, who is also the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the only one who is worthy to take and open the scroll. So I put a picture up here of the uh, seven seals. So it was a scroll. The Bible says book, and that word was used in Greek times for a volume of pa uh, pages that were put together. But they weren't, Gutenberg hadn't imprinted the printing, hadn't been in the printing press yet, and they weren't binding them in a book form. And so they were still using scrolls. And on the scroll, you can see on the far side, there's a seal. And this is the way they would do it. They would take a ribbon, they'd bring it down to the bottom, and they would seal it with wax, sometimes with clay. And that would seal the next portion of the book. You couldn't roll past that part because the seal would roll and would seal that part. And you'd have to break that seal, roll it to the next seal. And that's how this worked. That's what John is seeing. That's what the Lamb, Jesus Christ, is doing. So the first seven seals are what are known as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first seal is the Antichrist who will rule the world by bringing a false peace to Israel and a false peace to the world. This is the signing of his covenant begins the great tribulation. The writer is uh, in white and he has power and he has a crown. When we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we see that when Jesus Christ comes back, he is dressed in white and he has a crown and he has a sword. This is the imitation. This is the Antichrist, the opposer to Christ, the false imitation. And he comes in the name of the Messiah. He gives peace to Israel. And many believe this is the Messiah. But what follows him is the second seal, which is widespread war. The third seal is famine and scarcity, which always follows war. The fourth seal is disease and death, which always follows war and starvation. The fifth seal is the persecution and martyrdom of the saints on the earth. The sixth seal is the great earthquake, the natural catastrophes and disasters. And finally, the seventh seal contains the seven trumpets and opens the next series of judgments and tribulations. So, there's a chart up here that should show you a comparison that I want you to see between Matthew chapter 24. I'm sorry, I went too far. Go next one. Matthew chapter 24 and Revelation chapter 6. When you read Matthew chapter 24 and you read it beside Revelation chapter 6, you're going to see it's the same prophecy. Just as Man Matthew and Daniel are the same prophecies. These are very closely aligned. Al aligned. Revelation chapter um, 2, the first seal, the Antichrist on the white horse, is verse 5 of Matthew chapter 24, the false Christ. In chapter, uh, uh, let's go back to Matthew. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, there are wars. In verse 3 of chapter of Revelation, there are uh, a war rides on a red horse. In uh, chapter 7, 24, verse 7, if you're not confused, imagine where I'm at. Uh, that's the famines, and that's the third seal, famine and scarcity. Then in Matthew, there's pestilence. That's the fourth seal. Death rides on a pale horse. The word means the color of a corpse, and that is pestilence. That is pandemic to the nth degree. Verse 9 in Matthew chapter 20, where the saints are persecuted. In verse 9 of uh, Revelation chapter 6, the fifth seal is opened, and the martyrs cry out who have died in time of tribulation. Finally, in verse 7 of Matthew chapter 4, there were earthquakes in diverse places. And here in chapter 6, 
verse 12 of Revelation, the sixth seal is an earthquake and other natural disasters. It's the same prophecy. Many people have tried to take Matthew chapter 24 and say, this is the sign of the times. When you see these things happening, then you're getting close to the Lord coming back. That's true only if you put that inside the tribulation. It starts with the covenant signed by the Antichrist. That starts Matthew chapter 24. It starts Revelation chapter 6. It starts Matthew chapter 9. It's all the same prophecy. And it's all within that time, same time period. We as God's people today are not to be looking for signs. Jesus condemned people who look for signs. We as God's people today are supposed to be living like his parable of the ten virgins waiting for the wedding. Always ready, always with our lamp, always looking for the bridegroom to come. We're looking for the rapture. We're not looking for all these other things to take place and then look for him to come. We should be looking right now. We believe and should be looking for the imminent return of Christ. That means at any moment. And if you're looking in Matthew chapter 24 and saying, I need another war over here, I need another earthquake over here, I need this to happen and that to happen, then I'll be looking, then you're not doing what the Lord's told us to do. we are be looking right now at this exact time, he could come back. There are no signs, but after he takes us, then the signs start. The covenant is signed, and then those people who are left behind, still God's people, by nation, by name at least, those people will look and say, you know what, this is happening. It was all true. That was the Messiah. And they began to look at the signs because God is warning his nation, you better run. You better be careful. You better not get that mark of the beast. The opening of the scroll for which all of heaven is waiting and longed for has finally begun. And events that take place like acts from an orchestrated script are terrible to see. War, famine, pandemics, mass confusion, mass anarchy, mass uh, dissolution as the world looks to the most evil man who has ever lived to save them. But instead he brings his own destruction and is worse than what they were enduring. I know that sounds like today, but it's not today. It's going to be worse. It may get more and more like it, but it's going to be a lot worse. Perhaps this is why in the midst of such horror and desolation... John is given this vision of Revelation chapter 7. And it will be here that we conclude this morning in hope, in faith, that God is still working, will always be working, even when it seems darkest and most hopeless. So our concluding, Revelation chapter 7, it's a great place to conclude. This is the sealing of the 144,000 and the great white robed multitude. Just look at the first eight verses. And after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. That means he has his authority. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. These are the angels who are going to open with the trumpets, and that wrath of God is poured upon the earth, but they're held in check by this angel saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. And I'm going to read through all the tribes, but these are the tribes of Israel that are sealed. So these four angels wait. They are not allowed to act in the judgment of God until the sealing of the 144,000. These sealed ones are God's people. They weren't taken up. Because they had not yet understood who the Messiah truly was. And they are named as the tribes of Israel. And here they are called the servants of God. Not just Jews, but those chosen, sealed for a special service to God. During the tribulation, these sealed ones, these chosen ones, will be God's witnesses upon the earth proclaiming the coming of the kingdom. They're needed because the church is no longer here. Because you and I, if we put our faith in Jesus Christ, will have been taken up. And therefore, there needs to be a house of witness. And so God takes these 144,000, he seals them, he chooses them, and he says, you're now that house of witness. You are the ones who are giving out the gospel and telling the world to repent for the kingdom of God is coming. The task of warning and preaching falls back to the people of God, Israel, as it was in the Old Testament. So in this last verse, chapter 9, verse 17, look at this wonderful picture. It it comes from a bad place, but it's a beautiful picture. 
of this great white robed multitude. Revelation chapter 7, go down to verse 9. After this, he says, this has all happened. The book's been opened. The angels are waiting, poised at the four corners of the world to bring the next series of God's judgment. And he says, after this, I beheld. And lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand, cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and they fell before the throne in their faces. And they worship God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might. Be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered saying unto me, What are these which have arrayed in white robes and whence came they? And I said unto her, Sir, thou knowest. Unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in this temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. There shall no hunger, they shall hunger no more, neither thirst no more. Neither shall the sun light on them any, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them. And shall lead them unto living fountains of water. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. If anybody ever tells you that no one's going to be saved during the tribulation, I would challenge, I would ask them, then who are these people? God is not shut down by Satan. God is not shut in a box because Satan brings great tribulation. It's at those times that God shows his power. His light shines the brightest in those darkest, darkest corners. And so when we look at Revelation chapter 7, we see a multitude that no man can number. That's, that's amazing because later on, John counts up to 200 million people in an army. And he's saying this number is even greater than that. How many people are going to be saved in the tribulation? How many who heard the gospel but did not accept in time? How many uh, of the nation of Israel are going to suddenly realize we got it completely wrong? That was our Messiah. How many other people are going to suddenly hear the gospel preached by these 144,000 fearlessly at the cost of their life? And they're going to say, it's happening. All those movies and books and all those things I may have made fun of, those things were real. Everything I heard that preacher preaching, it's real. The Lord is coming and I'm going to put my faith in him. And their faith is real because they give their life to prove their testimony. They're willing to die for what they believe in. These 144,000 have washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb <laughs> through great tribulation. This great multitude shows that God will triumph. Innumerable multitudes will be saved out of the tribulation by the grace and power of God. Satan, even at his strongest, most dominating position over this world, cannot stop the light of God. The love of Christ or the loud voice of the gospel. God's people will give their lives because they know the truth. Satan's kingdom must come down and Jesus, Lord and King, is coming to rule and reign. In seven years, in seven years it will happen and they know it because they know when it started. This is also our application. It's our hope. It's our lesson. I don't need to know when he is coming back because I know he is coming back. I don't need to know when the darkness will end because I know the light will always overcome the dark. Daniel 9, Matthew 24 in the book of Revelation was never about when. It's never about why. It was always about who. That who is Jesus, Lord, Messiah, King, Son of God, very God of very God, ruler and Savior. That is who it is all about. That is what it has always been about. It's always been Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Whatever any of us might be going through, however hopeless it might seem, if you're his child, if you are a part of his kingdom, if you are one of his people, it's not dark enough for God's light not to reach you. It's not hopeless enough that you can't see and know that he has a plan and he's working and that you are in his focus and under his protection and grace. It's all about Jesus. Let's.
take our hymn books and stand.